This is A Different Perspective with Kevin Randall. A retired U.S. Lieutenant Colonel, Kevin Randall has been studying UFOs for nearly 50 years. Kevin has investigated some of the most famous UFO cases in the world and has been consulted for dozens of documentaries about UFOs. Considered one of the leading experts into the Roswell UFO crash of 1947, Kevin has written more than 25 books about UFOs, including the recently published Roswell in the 21st century. Now, here is the host of A Different Perspective, Kevin Randall. And welcome to this edition of A Different Perspective. I'm going to make one comment uh, which I probably shouldn't, but I will. Uh, when he says I've written more than 25 books on UFOs, I think the count now is 37. I just thought I'd mention that. We don't often get that. Anyway, I am being joined by Stephen Bassett, um, who is, I guess, the um, uh, the uh, lobbyist. That was the word I was searching. Lobbyist about UFOs. Uh, those of you who have been here before know who Steve Steve is. Uh, for over the past 25 years or more, uh, he has helped shape the language and the and chart the course uh, for major political movements here in the UFO field. He has lectured around the world and given over 1,200 radio and television interviews about the implications on disclosure, which we'll be talking about here as well. Um, and and uh, his advocacy work has been extensively covered by the news media, such as CNN, Fox News, ABC, CBS, NBC, MSNBC, and over 500 articles from 2004 to 2010. He produced six exopolitics uh, conferences in the Washington, D.C. area, each uh, accompanied by press events at the National Press Club. In 2013, he produced a citizen hearing on disclosure, which I was a participant in, uh, over five days with six former members of Congress and 42 witnesses from 10 countries. This was followed in 2015. Um, as, uh, I can't read my notes here now. Anyway, Bassett has appeared in many documentary films, and his lectures and interviews uh, are well represented in YouTube. In December 2003, Steve co-founded the Hollywood Disclosure Alliance in Los Angeles, a new media center organizing to uh, align with those working for the UAP ET research arena with writers, directors, and producers working across every faucet of the global entertainment industry. I apologize for this because my printer didn't print it out quite as well as it should have, and uh, I kind of fumbled that. Anyway, uh, Steve has done a, a lot of good work in the uh, UFO arena and has produced an awful lot of interesting uh, documentaries and conferences. That uh, Stephen Bassett, welcome to A Different Perspective. Hi, Kevin. It's good to see you again. I, I hope I didn't botch that too badly. <laughs> nah, you can't botch my that? resume. I would <laughs> add one thing. Thanks to the podcast revolution, I'm now approaching 2,000 interviews. Uh, well, I, and I kind of updated my book count too, so we're both on the same page. There you go. Sure. Yeah. Uh, you've been a big advocate for disclosure for a long time. Tell me a little bit about the disclosure um, history, I suppose, would be the best way to say it. One of the things that an activist movement has to do is create the language that describes what is going on and where you have to go, right? Uh, activism is all about getting authority, governments, what have you, to do something they don't want to do. Uh, and in service to authorities' desires to not do what they don't want to do, they create the language that services their agenda not the public's agenda. So I played a role in shaping the language on this issue. Uh, the first thing that I did was, uh, as I started doing interviews, is to try to change the term UFO cover-up to truth embargo. Call it UAP truth embargo, ET truth embargo. I prefer to call it ET truth embargo, but truth embargo which I like to put a capital T and a trap capital E on because it's a big deal. It was quite a, quite a, quite a project on the part of the government. And the reason for that is that UFO cover-up implies that the government's actions were legal, fundamentally illegal, which means that everybody that serviced them going all the way back to Truman were criminals. 
And in order to get this issue resolved, we need lots of support and help from those inside government that serve the country. Not calling them criminals is not how you, you get their support. So truth embargo. Right? Then the second thing I did, and this was around the same time, a little later, around 2001 maybe, is I came up with the term disclosure with a capital D. The term disclosure had been used as kind of this disclosure process, meaning getting stuff out, revealing, like what you do. All the books you've written is all part of the small d disclosure process, right? But in order to have an activist movement, you have to have a prize. You have to have somewhere that you, you need to go to accomplish. And it has to be defined and clear. Otherwise, why should people invest their time, risk their reputations, sometimes even their lives, to support it? If it's just a, a, an amorphous idea, like peace on earth, we, need, we want peace on earth, right? So let's get out there. What? What does that mean? So the prize for the movement, uh, the political movement regarding this issue, I, I said that that's disclosure with a capital D. Uh, and what does that mean? It means the confirmation event. The moment that a head of state, and has to be by head of state, uh, confirms that the lie that the governments, uh, pretty much in general, have been promulgating for now 77 years uh, is over. And that the truth is, yes, we, we do have a non-human, almost certainly extraterrestrial presence. That is capital D disclosure. It happens the moment those words come out of the mouth of a head of state in front of a camera, not in a private discussion over lunch. Haven't, haven't, we, haven't we had that sort of thing in the past? Some heads of state uh, in various countries have kind of suggested that. Well, kinda is not disclosure. Kinda <laughs> is the formal confirmation of the of the presence of non-human technology, in other words, extraterrestrial presence, by a head of state formally. Uh, that that has never happened. So that is the goal of this of this movement. Right? So those are two of the language uh, contributions I've made. All right, and. Uh, my work has then been about achieving that prize. Uh, I'm not alone. There are plenty of people that want to see that. There are plenty of people that are, have been working in various ways, though for many years they didn't really, hadn't defined where they wanted to go, but they, they, were, they wanted to go somewhere. They wanted the truth out in kind of a general sense. For most of the 77 years since the Roswell event, which you obviously know a great deal about, uh, it's all been about proving it, proving it, proving it, proving it, proving it. Research and research upon research and studying reports and sightings by the thousands and on and on and on to prove it. And well, they did prove it. They proved it many times over and yet nothing happened. Uh, hmm. Why is that? Because well, let me let me let me interrupt. You say prove it. Now, you're suggesting that the investigations in Roswell established that what uh, fell there was an off-world craft, and I I use the world the term off-world because it came from Blade Runner and it's kind of cool and it means the same thing. Um, Level Land seems to be one of those cases as well. Is there cases that uh, you think of as having proved it that uh, somehow gets uh, delayed by by the government or derailed by uh, the news media and things like that? The, the way to think of it is, is the uh, collective approach. In other words, it's the same way you deal with, with, with trials where you have to prove beyond a reasonable doubt something in order for someone to end up going to prison for the rest of their life. The, the extraterrestrial presence, whether you want to call it non-human, whatever, I call it extraterrestrial, meaning it's, it's not human beings that were born on this planet and went to elementary school or whatever the hell. I mean, they're, 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 not, they're not us. Uh, it has been proven through the collective work, the totality of the evidence. It, you, you, don't, you don't prove something on the base of a single thing. You, you cannot convict anybody uh, of a serious crime in a court of law based upon a single piece of evidence. It just doesn't happen. Because any single piece of evidence can be wrong or faked uh, or what have you. So it's the collective. And what I'm trying to say is the collective work of countless people from day one, practically, 
going all the way back to the 40s and Keo and so forth, um, proved long ago that this is a non-human presence. Now, whether a particular case, right, uh, holds up or doesn't hold up is less important than the collective evidence is absolutely beyond a reasonable doubt. And so piling more and more cases and more and more research on top of it, on top of it, was what people were trying to do in hopes that it would be so overwhelming that the government would have to concede, yes, we're not alone. Now, that's not the way it works in the scientific world, in the, in the world of the scientific um, uh, process, which is one of the greatest inventions in human history. You, you examine something that deserves study in order to understand it in many cases, to actually arrive in an extraordinary new understanding of the nature of the world or a particular law. And so you pursue that oh, with a, a scientific method of experiment, right, uh, discovery and what have you. And then you publish the, the reports of your work for review by other scientists. Uh, and at some point, uh, the scientific world uh, starts to arrive at a consensus that what you have what 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 you have presented is in fact true. It's established as a a scientific truth, subject to review, all right. But nevertheless, it is a scientific truth. And once that has been established, you move on to something else, all right. That's not the way this has worked. This is the equivalent of say the relativity theory emerging in the early 1900s, going through a peer review process and the scientific world saying, uh, we're, we're starting to see, see validity here and they run a couple of experiments and seems to confirm it. And the government comes in and says, those experiments are, are, are nothing, they're void, they mean nothing, this is not true. And so more experiments are done and the government says, no, there's nothing to this, it's not true, we won't acknowledge it. And this goes on for decades. And so 50 years after Einstein comes forward with this theory, we still haven't established the validity of the, of the uh, uh, relativistic science. Of course, that is not how it works. And if it did, we would be nowhere right now. We wouldn't be on the moon. We wouldn't be anywhere. And so the process of truth finding was corrupted by a political decision on the part of the US government that no matter how much proof you piled up, you could fill rooms with it. You could do a thousand reports. It doesn't matter. It isn't true. It's not going to prove anything. And of course, that is politics. Well, let, That's let, me, let me interrupt here. Let, I, I need to interrupt here because we need to take a break. When we come back, I'm going to ask you about how disclosure has advanced in the last few years. And are we any closer to the oh, truth? Sure. I'll be right back with Stephen Bassett. And we'll be talking about this. So please stick around. <music> Are you ready for a tale that will leave you on the edge of your seat? Get ready to dive into the gripping memoir by Bart Sabrell titled Moon Man. Bart Sabrell takes you on a heart-pounding journey, unmasking the truth behind America's famous Apollo missions. Prepare yourself for hair-raising encounters with agents from the U.S. government's top secret agencies. In Moon Man, Sabrell fearlessly reveals his real-life espionage adventures, shining a light on one of the CIA's best-kept secrets. Brace yourself for shocking revelations, including Sabrell's discovery of privately recorded audio exposing an Apollo astronaut's chilling plot, a plot orchestrated by the CIA. That's right, as Sabrell unveils this groundbreaking evidence, it becomes clear that there is much more to the Apollo missions than meets the eye. Could it be that we've been deceived all along? Moon Man is a gripping page-turner that challenges everything you thought you knew. It's a mind-bending journey into the unknown, where the line between truth and fiction becomes blurred. Don't miss this opportunity to uncover the secrets hidden for decades. Let your curiosity guide you as you join Bart Sabrell on his quest to find the truth. Moon Man, available now at Sibrel.com. That's S-I-B-R-E-L.com. Prepare to have your beliefs shaken to the very core.
I am here Hi. with Stephen Bassett. We are talking now about disclosure. And you mentioned, of course, the truth embargo, which I think is a really nice phrase when you think about it. But I wonder, I wonder, do you have any idea why originally they co they covered up, they failed to disclose uh, the information gathered at Roswell and, and why that continued for literally decades? Sure. Uh, now, again, it's my interpretation of this and other researchers have their own interpretation. Uh, and it's an interpretation because obviously the government has never told us why they did it because the government doesn't acknowledge that, that it's happened, right? So therefore there's nothing to acknowledge, but I think the explanation is not complicated. Historians will, will uh, parse it out and give us a lot of detail, which we must have. I mean, hopefully we'll have all that because it's an one of the great stories of human history is that, uh, and it's not, it's, it's, you know, I can do three hours standing on my head on that question. All right. So let me do it in a few minutes. Uh, the, the presence of ETs escalated after the uh, World War II and the, and the, the bombs dropped in Hiroshima. Uh, there seems to be clearly a connection between those events and the modern ET presence, which again starts in the late 1940s. Um, and so when the Roswell crash occurs, which is the first real significant event in the modern era that triggered, again, the whole disclosure process in a sense. Uh, one can say Kenneth Arnold sighting just a week or so prior to it was it, but no, it's important, no question. But the Roswell event is a big deal because they put out a press release saying, yeah, we've got one of those vehicles. Um, so uh, uh, let me gather my thoughts. Um, um, well, let me let me ask you a question while you gather your thoughts there. Uh, you mentioned the beginning being 1947, basically, uh, with the Kenneth Arnold sighting. But what about the yeah. Foo Fighters and the Ghost Rockets and other sightings that uh, predated Kenneth Arnold? Well, there are sightings that go back hundreds of years. I'm simply saying the beginning of the modern era really gets underway with, with the Roswell uh, event. So uh, all of that is happening in the early days, years after the end of uh, World War II. And so at the time that Roswell happens and they put that press release out, which was the first opportunity for the for the truth of the ET presence to to be known worldwide, we came so close. Uh, it, it fell into the hands of, of uh, President Truman, obviously, what to do when he was informed that they had that vehicle and those bodies. Now, it's notable the press release did not mention bodies. If the press release had mentioned bodies, I don't think they could have gotten out of it. I think they were pinned, but it didn't. And so well, Truman let, is let, let, let me point out the reason they didn't mention bodies at that point, I don't think they'd found them. That's uh, true. The, 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 very they, likely found the they hadn't found the second the second crash site yet. Right. They found so, the again, debris field, which gave them an idea of something very strange had happened there, but they hadn't found the rest of the craft. And that that came in, I think, a couple of days later. Whatever, whatever, I think you're right, but whatever they had, it was sufficient for that press release to go out. And so that that that's a big deal. That's kind of the trigger. Boom. And off to the races we go. So that information goes to Truman. He has decision to make. Do we go with this and announce it and confirm it to the public? Or do we take some time to consider what the hell is going on here? And I believe that he made the decision to step back and think about it. And ultimately, he decides to 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 uh, instruct uh, Ramey uh, over at Dallas Fort Worth. Look, you've got to undo that as quickly as possible. And he cho he chooses to hold another press conference. He holds up uh, phony bullshit and says, "No, it's just a, a weather balloon," and dampens the story down. And things kind of go back to normal. And and at that point, they have some time to reflect whether it's a week, a month, or years, the government has time to think about what are we going to do about this? And that's where it gets complicated, but yet not too, uh, not too obtuse. At, at the time they're thinking about, and we're talking about late 47, 48, 49, they're considering what to do about this situation. They, they are fully aware that the Soviet Union has, has, has in its possession 
uh, the secrets regarding the creation of the atomic and the hydrogen bomb. And they're working on both and they intend to test them and they intend to put them in their arsenal. So they know they're facing what could be some sort of nuclear arms race and potentially a third world war that would be nuclear. The political situation is clear. There's already an iron curtain uh, across Europe. Uh, everybody is digging in and it is going to be now the West against the communist empire, I guess you could say. And this is serious. Uh, and so as, as they're reflecting on this, they decide, I believe, that we got our hands full here and telling the world, oh, by the way, there's non-human beings and uh, entities engaging us and they have tech and we have crash vehicle, if not more than one. I think they had several within the first couple of years. Premature. Uh, we can't do that. And plus, uh, as the as the as the international risk uh, increases, the national security issues increase. Meaning, what is the potential weaponization of that technology? Uh, does the Soviet Union have crash vehicles? Uh, uh, we need to understand that, and we therefore we can't be telling people that we have that kind of tech or we have those vehicles. And so it's all national security in the early days, and it was well serviced by the fact that. What we learned in World War II, to to greater extent than any previous war, is that wars are won by intelligence, okay, by cracking the Enigma code and spying and what have you. Okay, and so we built very rapidly the greatest intelligence complex. Started building it at the world had ever seen, starting with the 1947 National Security Act, the the conversion to the CIA, the creation of the NSA, and on and on and on. Uh, we were going to use intelligence to uh, protect this country. And so all of that, the creation of that serviced uh, the issue of the ET uh, presence, uh, meaning we have the means to, to keep this under wraps. We have the means to classify it. We have the means to, to deal with the public's interest. And so the reason for the truth embargo is fundamentally a political decision based on national security, which could not be dismissed. I mean, I, I, if I were in the shoes of those men, mostly all men, in 1947, 48, 49, right up to 52, when they had the second opportunity to end the truth embargo, I would have probably made the same decision. And then what happened after that is simple. The nuclear arms race that they thought was going to happen happened big time. Right. The national security risk grew with every passing year. Proxy wars took place where millions of people died. In other words, it was a bad 77 years. And and as a result, the ET presence had to remain classified no matter what it took. And let me tell you, they pulled out no stops to somehow keep this truth from the from the from the world's people. And while that is not you know, utterly remarkable because, it, you know, it's not impossible to have a secret. The truth embargo was never a secret. The truth embargo was a propaganda program designed to make you think something wasn't there when, in fact, you could see it all the time. In other words, it's a don't believe your lying eyes, not some classified thing you know nothing about. And every year that passed, the phenomena grew. The number of people that saw it grew. The number of people that were understanding it was true grew. And in spite of the fact that it eventually reached hundreds of millions of people, even today, the government's position is there's no there there. So it's one of the most remarkable events in human history. It's the greatest lie ever told, the greatest, I mean, the greatest lie ever and the greatest story ever told. But it's about to end. This policy of embargo is about to end, thank God. Well, this springs, uh, brings a question to my mind, which would be, uh, why would Blanchard issue the press release? And was it a plan designed to kind of kill the story which they knew was going to come out? So they have a lower headquarters of 509th Bomb Group say, we've got a flying saucer without actually defining what the flying saucer is. And three hours later, General Ramey at the higher headquarters says, no, no, it's just a weather balloon and here it is. Yeah. Could that could could they have been that smart to have created that lie that quickly? No, no. The, the, things were happening very, very fast. Uh, and there was no. Uh, look, whatever the government knew about the issue by, via the Foo Fighter stuff uh, is probably not that much. Now, there is speculation. We may have had a crash vehicle prior to 47. 
There's the talk about a 30, 1933 crash that we may have got our hands on. But whatever happened prior to Roswell, it was pretty tightly held. Uh, it wasn't out there. It was very tightly held. And so when this event happens outside of Roswell, the the men who and women who were serving us at that base, really, it, it caught them by surprise. What in the hell is going on here? And um, and, and, and it, 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 it's, it's probably an accident. But it just happened to happen a short time after a very significant sighting had gone public. The Arnus, Arnold sighting was a played a major major factor in what happened at Roswell, because of that extraordinary sighting. It was getting tons of attention. Very credible man, describing the things. Okay, so when very likely the evidence points to what crashed at Roswell was the same kind of craft that Ar Arnold was seeing over Mount Rainier, it, it made made it a lot more likely that they were going to go whoa. We got one of those, okay? And so the decision was made, put out the press release, and then, of course, we know what happened after that. So I'm going to, I think, I tend to take things on, on face value until I get real strong uh, evidence or what have you that, no, no, it's more than that. It's a hidden thing, what have you. Um, I'm you know, kind of a rock comes razor guy. I think they just put out a press release, and, and then the government realized, uh-oh, uh, that's not a good thing. And so they had to reverse it uh, and, and not, not to reverse it because, oh, we have to keep this secret forever. Or even they thought about what a truth embargo was, but rather we need some time to reflect on what we have here and what the public learning about it would mean right now in the, in the context of what we're facing, which is the, the lead up to the third world war, which clearly is going to use nuclear weapons. Uh, and so I, I do not second guess them on making the decision to reverse the press con uh, reverse the uh, initial press release. Uh, the problem comes much down the line when they literally marry themselves to this uh, embargo uh, until death do us part. Well, I, I agree that given the circumstances in 1947, we just fought a disastrous war that killed millions and millions of peoples, and ended with the bombing of the uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki, mm -hmm. that it was a matter of national security and they placed it all under that umbrella. But the other thing that, that uh, strikes me is because you kind of mentioned the Arnold sighting and the importance of it and the possibility of what crashed in Roswell mm -hmm. was a similar craft. On July 7th, 1947, a guy named Rhodes uh, living in Phoenix, Arizona, took two photographs of something that looked remarkably like what Arnold originally described. And according to what Arnold said later, that he was told by two Air Force intelligence officers, um, Lieutenant Brown and Captain Davidson, or Captain Davidson and Lieutenant Brown, um, who came to help him with an investigation into another UFO, that the photograph matched what he had seen. And that was kind of disturbing to them at that time. But I'm going to have to take a break here, I see. Mm -hmm. When we come back, I promise we're going to move to disclosure after 2017 and how that kind of influenced where everybody was going and how the attitude in the media shifted a little bit to uh, suggesting that UFOs might not be uh, terrestrially based. So we'll be back right after this with Stephen Bassett. So please stick around. Welcome to Haunted Indian River County by Larry Lawson. Indian River County is an idyllic vacation spot on Florida's east coast, not far south of Cape Canaveral. Known as part of the state's famed Treasure Coast, many are unaware of the deep and fascinating history this area played in the development of the Sunshine State. Also lost among its visitors and residents are the chilling stories of the hauntings that accompany this rich history. It is here that a man named Waldo still looks after his family and properties, six decades after his death. Or a retired preacher is seen digging up his hidden treasure, days after he died. Larry Lawson spent more than 40 years in the law enforcement and criminal justice education profession. He holds a Bachelor of Science degree from Nova Southeastern University and a Master's degree in Public Administration from Troy State University. 
he serves on the board of directors of the Indian River County Historical Society, is the director of the Florida Bureau of Paranormal Investigation and is the owner of Indian River Hauntings, LLC, where he provides historical and paranormal tours and events. He has been actively researching the history and paranormal legends of the Treasure Coast of Florida since 2010. Larry is currently the host of Paranormal Stakeout Radio TV show on the Exozone Broadcast Network and the past host of Encounters with the Other Side on WPSL Radio in Fort Pierce, Florida. Pre-order your copy of Haunted Indian River County by Larry Lawson on Amazon.com today. I am back with Steve Bassett. Before we get into our discussion, I don't want to forget to mention this. You're going to be at, what is it, Encounter in the Desert coming up here at the end of at, end of May. Can you tell us briefly a little bit about that? A contact in the Desert. Contact in the Desert. It's the 10th, 10th anniversary of this very significant conference, Contact in the Desert. Um, uh, it, it used to be uh, really out in the desert, right? <laughs> Uh, but a uh, little crude, a little too hot. So for a number of years now, it's been held at the very nice Indian Wells Esmeralda Renaissance Resort. Anything with a name like that, you know, it's like, wow, it's high end. Um, and this year is its 10th anniversary. We have 73 speakers, six tracks. Uh, it, it starts on Thursday with some introductory uh, lectures for what we call them the 101s runs all the way through Monday night, including Monday, the intensives were like three hour presentations. Uh, there was a banquet there. It's loaded. And so if you would like to be at this event, you need to uh, check out the website, contact in the desert org. I have to alert you to the, all of the rooms in the entire resort have been booked already. However, there are plenty of hotel rooms that are available in the near surround. And also, uh, we're going to be heavily marketing the conference this year to, to Los Angeles and Orange County uh, for the first time ever. The contact in the desert is allowing day passes so people can drive on over from from the ocean and uh, spend the day and go back or drive over and book a room nearby and uh, the whole conference. So we're doing that also for anybody that comes over from L.A. and Orange County uh, the first day, uh, Thursday is free, right? That's a freebie if you come in early. Uh, and then the conference starts the following day on Friday. So uh, this is Contact in the Desert. Check it out. The website is spectacular. And uh, uh, things are happening that may make this more of a celebration than just a conference. Uh, to point that out, last year at the Contact in the Desert uh, event, the last day was June the 5th. There were still hundreds of people still there for the final intensives. And when I woke up that morning, everybody was running around the hotel with their hair on fire. Uh, I, I wasn't because, well, there's really not much up there to be on fire. Uh, but the reason was that everyone had learned that uh, uh, a, 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 an article had just been published in the debrief regarding a man named David Grush, who was coming forward with extraordinary testimony as a former member of the UAP task force. Uh, confirming a non-human tech, non-human bodies. And then, of course, we, he was he was interviewed that same day live by Ross Coulthard on News Nation. We all got together in a room and watched this. We watched this interview. And he instantly knew that this was a game changer. Maybe well, let, me, the the let, me inter let, it, let me interrupt here because uh, you gave me an opportunity to promote one of my books, Encounter in the Desert, which is about the Lonnie Zamora sighting. So sure. it... Uh, a long look at that, and when everybody thought that Lonnie Zamora was kind of a single witness sighting, it turns out not to be true. If you look beyond the initial uh, reports on that in the Blue Book files, you find other witnesses to, to that, uh, that event. That's Encounter in the Desert, which you can get at Amazon. Uh, I'm going to back you up a little bit because you were talking about David Grush. Um, his stuff came out literally years after what I think of was one of the pivotal points, which was the Leslie Keene, Ralph Blumenthal article in the New York yeah. Times in 2017 about the Nimitz. Uh, th that moved us a little bit closer to disclosure. 
Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I, you asked me about the conference, so I skipped ahead. Look, uh, yes. <laughs> here's the best way. I, here's the simplest way I can say this. In the 28 years that I've been involved in this, believe it or not, 27, uh, I, I understood that it was impossible to be able to predict how the end would happen, right? What would be the way and the mechanisms and so forth? The end was was defined. It had to be disclosure with a capital D, confirmation. Uh, so didn't know, right? Uh, but it would happen. There was no question the truth embargo was simply could not last all that much longer. And so the end game in this complicated four to four player chess game begins on December of 2017. You could say it begins in October when the To the Stars Academy of Arts and Science announces its uh, presence on the web and gives a, 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 a video introduction. And we learn of the 10 people that are coming forward, pretty significant people. Uh, that was certainly a wake up call for me. And I pretty much knew immediately what that meant. But for most people, no. However, the New York Times article, which was presented to the New York Times by the individuals that had come out in October, just two months earlier, those articles basically changed history and they triggered the end game, which we are now seven years in. It didn't have to be seven years. They, I believe they intended to come out not in 17, but in 16. And if they had, and the election had gone a different way, I think we would be several years into the post-disclosure world, but that's not the way it worked. So they came out in 2017 and that begins the end game leading to quote, checkmate of the truth embargo. And it has been, and I, and I always knew that the end game for this truth embargo was going to be messy. It was not going to be simple, straightforward. It was going to be wild and crazy with twists and turns, uh, chaotic to some degree, because we're talking about the most profound event in human history happening at a time when hundreds of millions, if not a couple billion people, many billions of people, have an idea about it. They, they, they know what extraterrestrial means. They've seen the, the movies, right? Uh, there's a huge amount of interest already. And now this huge truth is coming. It was going to be wild and crazy. And it has been. So beginning then, what happened in the fewest words possible? And believe me, this is not easy for me. Uh, <laughs> I can <you> tell. <laughs> several of the members that came forward with the To The Stars Academy, notably Mellon, Elizondo, and, and Nolan, started engaging politicians, the general public through social media and scientists to lead up to, to start to begin the process that would lead to the hearings we have to have and disclosure by the president. This went on essentially for three years uh, from uh, December of uh, 17, 18, 19, 20. And during those three years, lots of meetings behind the scenes took place, lots of information, a huge amount of media coverage and so forth. So it's like an education curve going on. But the focus was on getting witnesses in front of members of Congress privately to sort of bring them up to speed. And this was going on pretty much behind the scenes, outside of the public eye, though we knew about it for three years until something was going to happen. And what happened was the first legislation in history on this subject was put forward in July of 2020 and signed in December of 2020 by uh, President Trump. Uh, this bill was submitted via the Intel Committee of the Senate and sponsored by the, the uh, chairman, Marco Rubio. And then after that, we have had four tranches of legislation. Uh, um, extraordinary. Four tranches of legislation, each one bigger than the other, right, over a period of three years. Now, during that legislation triggered more events. Most importantly, it started lowering the stigma dropping it almost to zero, right? Uh, making it easier for people to come forward, even providing protections for people coming forward. And so witnesses started coming forward. Uh, so in addition to all of the briefings that have taken place, now more witnesses are coming forward, structures being set up to talk to them. The Intel committee staff is certainly key here. Other committees were involved. And so the education of the Hill, Capitol Hill is growing rapidly. So this, this uh, takes place 2021, 2022, 2023. Meanwhile, the media coverage continues to grow to unprecedented levels. The number of articles written about this subject last year was the greatest in history, right? I know this because I track these articles 
And last year, I was able to log 1,800 into my print media archive, where you can find links to all of these articles, these 1,800, at paradigmresearchgroup.org. And those 1,800 were basically triaged out of three to 4,000 uh, overall coverage, but a lot of it is not important. It's uh, not professional press. It is whatever, and doesn't even take into account YouTube videos, which are now uh, exploding. So the media coverage is now educating the world. And so all of that is going on uh, while these uh, pieces of legislation are being put forward. Witnesses are coming forward, what have you. And so at some point, uh, obviously, the dam was really going to break. But and now this is the most important thing I'm going to tell your audience today. Uh, and I've been saying it hundreds and hundreds of times on podcasts. Thank God for podcasts. But I cannot get on CNN or in news station or any of the major venues to say this. And so this this particular message is, is sort of suppressed, I guess you could say. And here is that message for those of you either confused, uh, perplexed, uh, don't have very little history of this. And what the hell's going on? Everything that has been happening, certainly since 17, 2017, right up to the to today. Everything you're seeing going on has absolutely nothing to do with the United States government trying to find out what this thing going on is so that they can tell us, meaning, wow, apparently there's some unidentified stuff happening and, and, and we need to know about that. And there may be a threat issue or whatever the hell. It has nothing to do with that. Zero. Bupkis. Nietzsche vote. Well, then what's going on? Why are they doing all this? The legislation, the creating of organizations, the arrow, and all of this. It is to prepare for when the U.S. government, via the president of the United States, has to finally confirm this ET presence, disclosure, capital D, which will either come first from our president or it'll come later after another head of state of a major nation confirms it to the world. That is disclosure. They are preparing for it. Why? It's a simple it's a simple explanation. Try to imagine that the president of the, the you know China, Xi Jinping of China months ago, a year ago, made the decision the world needs to know about this, comes forward, right, with huge amounts of evidence in that big room they have and tells the Chinese people we're not alone and evidence is pouring out. And now the president has to confirm. In other words, disclosure has happened. And it's day one after disclosure. Untold numbers of journalists are going to be packing the halls of every briefing room in Washington, D.C., every service briefing room, the DOD briefing room, the White House, and on and on with thousands of questions. The public are going to be demanding, what the hell? And we want to know this. But there's no legislation. There's no arrow. There's been no briefing on the Hill. There's been no uh, run up or ramp. It's just chaos. They cannot allow that to happen. And so they had a rather difficult catch-22 situation. They had to prepare for disclosure, which they knew was coming, but they couldn't tell the world why. They couldn't say, oh, we have to get all this done and pass this legislation because we're going to have to tell you there's ETs here. Well, that's disclosure. And they couldn't disclose. And so what they had to do is couch it in the reasonable idea that, wow, there's clearly something going on here and we need to do this and this and this and this and this to deal with it. And people are going, good, 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 good. But the people that understand this issue, like you, like me and so many others, are going, what, what? This doesn't make sense. What are you talking about? You know that, whatever. But they had no choice. I get it. I accept it. It's okay. However, the reason that I am pounding this issue in every podcast I do, and I have done hundreds and hundreds of them since 2017, is this, it is in the best interest of the United States and the American people that they know that the government is having to lie their way out of an under out from under a much bigger lie, but for good purpose. Well, in other words, let me break I you know, right here because I'm going to have to take a break. When we come back, we'll, we'll, we'll be back in just a moment and we'll continue with that thought. Uh, please uh, stick around. <laughs> Thank you. 
Do you have a product or service you'd like to promote to a worldwide audience? Imagine your product featured on Mission Evolution Radio TV. If you're interested in showcasing your work, Mission Evolution is broadcast to the Exxon TV Channel 32, Simul TV, on the Exxon Broadcast Network, YouTube, iTunes, iHeartRadio, Amazon Music, Audible, and many other audio and social media platforms. Our professional studios can produce and broadcast your custom high-quality ad. It will be permanently embedded in each episode and featured in the archives for years to come. Together, we can make it happen. Contact us at info at missionevolution.org for more details. Spaces are limited, so don't miss out on this great opportunity. Email info at missionevolution.org today. We are back with Steve Bassett. We're talking about disclosure. We're talking about the reason for the sudden explosion of information about UFOs. And one of the things that, that struck me about this whole conversation was the, uh, the attempt to change the term UFO to UAP, as if it to divorce itself from the history of the UFO phenomenon and start all over again. Is that kind oh, of no, how no. you see? No, no. That's another language issue that I, I supported. I wasn't the only one, uh, but we we wanted to 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 make UAP legitimate. We wanted to make it in play, unidentified aerial phenomena. Uh, why? It means exactly the same as UFO, exactly the same, except that UAP doesn't carry six. Well, it didn't at the point, you know, 60, 70 years of stigma. In other words, everybody knows that there are certain terms of language with respect to various issues that are highly stigmatized such that you don't say them. You don't go on television and throw that term out, right? You know better. Uh, this is along those lines, but not quite as severe. In other words, UFO was fully stigmatized. So it had it created an instant response in people. Oh, so that's what you think. And that, that served the truth embargo and the government thrived on it. Okay. And so UAP was to say, well, here's a term you can, you can use to describe what's going on, but it doesn't have the stigma. It's too new. They haven't had an opportunity to stigmatize it. And why was that important? Because in the last days of the truth embargo, we needed to get journalists engaged at, a, at an unprecedented level. We needed to get members of Congress willing to speak about this. And so if they could come forward and say they're, they're talking about UAPs, no stigma. All right. And so it was purely a, uh, what do you call it? A, uh, a, 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 a utilitarian effort to make it easier for people to engage the issue. Now, the interesting thing about that is that while that was definitely happening, all four tranches of legislation, only one use of UFO in the entire legislation. And that's as a side thing to say, well, this is what that means. Uh, it's all UAP. OK. And, and that's that's not an accident. All right. Now, again, it's not our fault that the, the, the UFO was stigmatized, but we have to deal with it. And we have. And that's why UAP came along, not to reject the history, but to make it more accessible. And what's cool about this, because I chronicle all of the media. Right. In other words, I pretty much am reading and checking all of the English language media worldwide on this is that within about a year or two, UFO was back. And suddenly it's in the mouth of people and journalists and articles and everything else, favorable articles. In other words, the truth embargo, the, uh, the, the, the um, uh, uh, disclosure process was, was moving so well and, and so successful that people suddenly felt, hey, it's okay to say UFO again. All right. And so they were. Uh, now, it's, it, it's still, it, to my knowledge, better to uh, prefer to use UAP, which has become it went from unidentified aerial phenomena to unidentified anomalous phenomena, right? Uh, and that is really even a more appropriate. Uh, and ultimately, you know, the arrow is, uh, um, uh, what is arrow? It's uh, uh, all domain anomaly resolution office. 
And what you're literally seeing in that evolution of language is the, the government is literally on its own trying to come up with a language that really reflects what's going on, which is kind of good. And what's going on is these, these craft can fly in space, in the air, in the water, and they can even go through matter, right, underground. That's all domain. And the phenomena is not just craft flying around. There's a lot of things going on. And so the name of Aero, which was an excellent landing place, all domain anomaly resolution office uh, is exactly correct. And unidentified anomalous phenomena is particularly good, but whatever. We're, we are at a good place language wise right now. So I'm, I'm happy about that. Um, and so to get back to the question you asked earlier, as we've moved closer to disclosure, things have gotten increasingly chaotic. And then a major development occurred quickly. Grush came forward June the 5th of last year, he wasn't supposed to be in the game. He wasn't supposed to be part of the, the, the play, the script. He came forward for his own personal reasons and he upset the apple cart. Uh, and the government was thrown a curveball that they didn't know what to do with. Uh, and and we, we didn't know what was gonna happen next, but it accelerated things, but it also created a lot of uncertainty. And so eventually there had to be a response to Grush and the White House couldn't respond. The Congress, by and large, couldn't respond, though there was some uh, there was some activity going on at the House. So there was a response from the House, limited. The Department of Defense really couldn't do much. Uh, and so everyone was in an awkward position. Uh, John Kirkpatrick wrote a nasty letter about it to try to distance himself from Grush, big mistake. The, the uh, DOD put out a couple of things, but overall it was like, pretty much chaos. And so when was the response going to come to Grush? It came 39 days later. In other words, in other words, somebody decided to make some serious lemonade from that lemon, right? And it turned out to be none other, none other than uh, Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer. And so on July the 14th, 39 days after Grush gave his interview to Ross Coulthard, he announces that he is sponsoring the next uh, Senate legislation. And it would be called the UAP Disclosure Act. It would include the UAP Controlled Disclosure Plan. And it would have a UAP review board appointed by the president and members of co certain committees given uh, high access. And it would be all about bringing everything ultimately out of the secret world into the public domain and then archived. And this process would be orderly and oversaw it by the review board and others who would be given subpoena power and the highest level clearance. This is astounding. This is it. This was the package we've always wanted. This is essentially the, the, the game plan that will uh, bring about the end of the truth embargo. And then he dropped in something else. It was a master chess move by a master chess player. He said, this legislation will include eminent domain over the non-human tech and non-human bodies obviously referring to the testimony of David Grush. And that was a bomb that went off in the dining rooms at the, at the uh, Department of Defense and every defense contractor in the country. He said the, this, this legislation gives the United States government eminent domain of that non-human tech and non-human bodies that is in the hand of any civilian or any civilian company. And well, there's, what, there's one question. There's one question that strikes me here. David yeah. Grush talked about the Italian crash of 1933. That seems to be pretty well debunked by UFO researchers and colleagues in uh, in Italy uh, 20 years ago. That it was um, you, they can't verify the archives where things were supposedly stored. They can't verify uh, any of the other material that was released at that time. So it's making it a little bit more difficult to accept what Grush has to say, because that information was published, I think, in 1990 uh, about the investigation into the Italian crash. I would disagree. Uh, uh, Grush alluded to this. I think clearly it was mentioned to him. Right. And he alluded oh, obviously, to obviously, obviously. Yes. Yeah. And so. But, but OK, so what? Right. What is important? is the uh, the other testimony that he gave, which was much more substantial, 
uh, and and uh, easy, much easier to confirm. And that has happened because some of those uh, firsthand people have already come forward. And so uh, the fact that they crashed do you, in 1930. Do you, do you know who these firsthand people are? The Intel Committee knows. But you don't know. No. So there's no way for us, you, you and me or anybody on the outside to verify who these people are and what they know and what their positions were. Well, we know there we know that the firsthand people that talked to Grush, Grush said they were working on those programs. Uh, some of my colleagues are actually talked to people that have that are aware of this. I mean, there's people now in, in, from our world inside uh, dealing with members of Congress, IGs and everything else. So let me assure you that they they are real and they they will be eventually coming forward. And so ultimately, again, the, the, the 33 crash is simply not that important. He alluded to it. Uh, but the, the, again, to get back to what I was saying, is that uh, uh, Schumer's statement on July the 14th absolutely was a bombshell. He's telling the contractors, we, we will exercise eminent domain if we so choose over that non-human tech. So in that moment on July the 14th, the, the, the one of the most powerful men in Congress, Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer, confirms David Grush's testimony. Because if there's no non-human tech and non-human bodies, the government doesn't need eminent domain, obviously. Okay, he he supports the Senate's efforts to get this legislation out. He sends a message out to the world that, like, we're really serious about this because that legislation, 65 pages of it, went up on the Senate legislation page to be seen by anybody in the world that can that has an internet connection to read and get the message. And that message went right through the Pentagon, right through the defense contractors. They got the picture and they were not happy. And as a result, they pushed back and got the powers in the bill gutted, which was a brilliant thing, a part of the brilliance of his move, because by putting an eminent domain, he forced their hand. They had to come forward and essentially not by name, but acknowledge ah, we're not putting up with that. You're, you're not getting eminent domain. And by the way, we're taking all the powers out of the bill. So they got some people in Congress. They get a lot of uh, campaign money from defense contractors to gut the bill, which outed them for the first time ever. They were outed, the inside managers. And as a result, they helped confirm the ET presence. Why? Because if they do not have uh, uh, non-human tech and non-human bodies, they should not care one iota about the government wanting eminent domain over them. Checkmate. But it gets worse because well, after that, Steve, Stephen, I'm sorry, we're out of time. <laughs> I was afraid of that. <laughs> yeah, I I have to watch the clock. There's nothing I can do. Oh, you do. Uh, uh, you, you your website is paradigmresearchgroup.org, and this this kind of information appears on there in the various articles and uh, archives that you have. Oh, the uh, print media archive is loaded. And then my other website is HollywoodDisclosureAlliance.org. Check that out. Four months on. It's growing very quickly. It's a 501c3 nonprofit. We're looking for major support to help uh, educate the world about what's happening and what's going to happen. Well, thank you so much for taking some time today from your busy schedule to talk to me. Uh, that was Stephen Bassett, as we say, from the Disclosure Project and various other activities trying to bring all of this, I guess, into uh, into the limelight. Uh, for those of interested, I've been working on, actually, I've been working on action adventure books for the last uh, few weeks that have a deadline pushing on me. But I'm also still doing UFO research. You can take take a look at my blog at uh, kevinrandall.blogspot.com. I have some commentary on this. I will say that I am a little disturbed by the 1933 comments uh, of the Italian crash and the lack of um, sources on that. And that's the other thing I, I have a little bit of a problem with. We we hear about all of this stuff in the background, that, that there's these good sources. They have names. Names have been named. I always say that uh, Don Schmidt, uh, Tom Carey, and I have named names of people who were deeply involved in this, starting with General Exxon, Jesse Marcel, um, Edwin Easley, just to name a couple of the, the people from Roswell. So uh, I, that kind of makes it a difference here. We we name names. So far, we don't have anything that we can vet, that we can uh, verify so that we can say, yeah, this is really good. This is really solid. I will be back in a, a couple of weeks talking about uh, UFOs with other guests uh, here on the Different Perspective. And uh, thank you for tuning in.